All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to take a look here today at uh, 1.4 part two. So this is 1.4 part two. Uh, if you remember correctly, in the beginning of 1.4, we started talking about uh, how to combine functions together, uh, whether it's by addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. Um, and then we started talking about the composition of functions, where you literally took one whole function and put it inside of another function everywhere where there was an x. And that was kind of a review from our Algebra 2 uh, discussion, but the, the pre-calc stuff really comes from the idea that, okay, well, we can find the domains of these new functions. So that's what we practiced in 1.4 Part 1. The second half of this is going to get a little bit more intricate as we take a look at modeling with compositions of functions. So that's what Example 5 is going to be about taking a real life scenario and modeling it with a composition. Now let's just recap real quick. Remember, if you have two functions, f, and you have another function, g, a composition means some point in time, I am going to take f of x, I'm gonna take g of x, and I'm going to make it either f of g of x or g of f of x. That's what the composition is going to mean. And then we're going to end up getting a new function completely out of that. So keep that in mind as we're about to solve this, that that's the, that's the goal of this lesson still, is to be able to use compositions of functions. But the goal specifically in this video is going to be to be able to take a composition of functions and put it into a real life scenario. So in the example, it says, uh, in the medical procedure known as angioplasty, doctors insert a catheter into a heart vein and inflate a small spherical balloon. All right, so notice as I'm going through this, I'm starting to underline, I'm highlighting some key things. Inflate a small spherical balloon on the tip of the catheter. It says, suppose the balloon is inflated at a constant rate of 44 cubic millimeters per second. Part A says, find the volume after T seconds. And so a couple of things that I point out to me as I'm reading through this is number one, I'm dealing with a sphere. So at some point in time, I'm thinking it's functions. I gotta relate a function to spheres somehow, some way. The other thing that it says is that this balloon obviously is inflating with air um, at a specific rate, 44 cubic millimeters per second. But notice the key word, constant, 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 constant. That constant term tells us everything we need to know about modeling this function. Because it says find the volume after t seconds. So what this is asking for part A is what is the volume in terms of time? So really ask yourself, right? Pause the video if you need to. What is volume in terms of time? Every second that goes by, what is changing in the volume? Hopefully you understand that if every, uh, if, if this is constantly changing at 44 cubic millimeters per second, that is our mathematical model of volume in terms of time. The balloon is inflating by 44 every second. That's a linear model. When I see that word constant, that's my clue that, oh, that's going to be a linear model right there. And so there's our part A, volume in terms of time. Part B says, well, when the volume is V, what about the radius? So you might be thinking to yourself, radius? What, what radius are you even talking about? Well, think about it. I told you to circle the sphere in the beginning because this tells you the, about the functions we're going to have to utilize at some point in time. Because as you expand on that balloon, what's happening to it? It's getting bigger. And if it's getting bigger, the radius is getting bigger. And so you need something that's going to be able to say, as the volume is increasing, so is the radius. Well, what function can we use for that? Well, this does take a little bit of previous knowledge. And if you remember back in your geometry days, you have a formula for the volume of a sphere. The volume of a sphere, in this case, we're going to say it's V of R, 
is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now I didn't just pull this out of nowhere, all right? This is the standard formula for volume of a cube. But notice what this problem is asking. What is the radius r? At this point in time where we are, we have v of r, v in terms of r, volume in terms of radius. We have solved for v, but we haven't solved for r. So if it says what is the radius r, solve for r. So to solve for r, I'm going to go ahead and do my best to get r by itself, which means I'm going to multiply by 3 fourths on both sides so that the 4 thirds will cancel. I'm going to divide by pi. And so that at this point, I have r cubed is equal to 3v over 4 pi. And then to get rid of the cube, I'm going to cube root both sides. And so that means that r in the end, I'm going to put it over here, r in the end is the cube root of 3v over 4 pi. So that is now r in terms of v. You could almost write it as r of v. So this is important because now as we get to part c, it says write an equation that gives the radius back to our r, but in terms of time. Well, let's go back. At this point here, we have radius in terms of volume. So it's not radius in terms of time. So you can't just put the same equation. But what have we already found? Don't forget about our function that we found originally. We originally found volume in terms of time. Well, look what's inside of this radius in terms of volume. If I can make that V in terms of time, that means that I can make the radius in terms of time. So I could take the radius of T is just swapping out the v that we already had previously with something else that it's equal to. It's equal to 44t. So now we have radius in terms of time. And we didn't do anything different. The v that we had originally, now we just substituted what we know about it. And the last thing of the, the problem says, well, what is it after five seconds? So we want to find radius after five seconds. So we'll go ahead and substitute five on in. And um, just to multiply everything through, divide by four. I've done this a couple of times already, so I know what it all comes out to be. So you have the cube root of 165 over pi. And so if you're actually doing that in your graphing calculator, all right, you're going to hit math and then go down to number four where you're going to see something that looks like this. That was supposed to be a parenthesis. It looks something of the nature like that. All right. And then you'll go ahead and when you'll put it in, you'll just put 165 over pi. And then you roughly get about 3.74 millimeters. All right. So the last part of this section is to talk about implicit functions. All right. Implicit functions. Now let me explain this. I right? really pay attention here. The idea of something being implicit means that like, I mean, think about the term, right? When I think about the term, it's like implicitly it's this or implicitly it's kind of true. The reason why I kind of say it in that, in that voice or that tone is because you kind of got to do some digging or a little bit of manipulating to make things actually true. And that's ultimately what we're doing when we are find, defining functions implicitly. And so the easiest way to always show this is the idea of taking a equation of a circle. So if I take the equation of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals four, that's a circle with the center at zero, zero, and a radius of two. So the graph would look something
like that, right? Clearly, the vertical line test can say that this is not going to be a function. So that's why we didn't even say it was a function to begin with. It's a circle and has an equation, all right? It's an equation of a circle, not a function that is a circle, all right? It's a relationship between x and y. That's all that it really is. And you can kind of tell it because if you were trying to plug this into your calculator, like you couldn't plug that equation into your calculator because it has an x and a y in the equation. And so that kind of is your clue that, well, it's not going to be a function, but it doesn't mean that implicitly we can't do a little digging to find some functions within this relationship that happens to be a circle. So when you are trying to implicitly define functions, what you're looking to do is to solve for y. So when you are trying to implicitly define functions, we're going to go ahead and solve for y. So take a look at these steps. First thing to do to solve for y would be to subtract x squared on both sides. And then at this point, we'll square root both sides. And when you square root both sides, you have your plus or minus. So that's why we have our plus and our minus. But take a look here what happens. Look at this, what is now a function, square root of 4 minus x squared challenge you to pause the video. Do you have any ideas as to what this graph looks like? Think about where I got it from. I got it from a relationship that happened to be a circle. What do you think the square root of 4 minus x squared looks like? Well, a quick sketch of this graph actually shows, take a look. It's a semicircle, all right? It's a semicircle. Now the question I usually get is, well, you know, Mr. Guckin, there's a square root. How, why does it not look like a normal square root? Well, it doesn't look like a normal square root because of the square term that's underneath the square root, all right? But believe it or not, this positive side, the square root of four minus x squared, that's this from the graph. That's this part of the graph right here from our original circle. And then on the other side, y equals negative square root of 4 minus x squared. Well, where do you think this guy is? This right here is the negative side of the graph, all right? So this is right down in here. And so let's look at one other example as to how we can take a look and finish, uh, finish up our talk on implicit functions. So notice it says describe the graph of the relation, not of the function, not of the function. And so when we're doing so, look at this, look at this relationship. We have a squared term, a term that is doubled, and another squared term. Boy, I hope this looks familiar to you. Because if I gave this to you like this, I have a feeling you would have no problem solving, all right, for x in that case. But remember, when I'm solving implicitly, I'm solving for y. Having a y here and having a y here makes this challenging. But because of the way that this is set up, look at here, ladies and gentlemen, we can factor this out. This factors out to x plus y squared equals 1. Don't believe me? x plus y times x plus y x times x is x squared, x times y is xy, y times x is another xy, and then y times y is, of course, y squared. Boom, there is our 2xy from before. Now we can solve for y a lot easier. Square root, square root, x plus y equals plus or minus 1, and then y equals negative x plus or minus 1. And so what this allows us to do is to now break this apart like we did in the previous example. And now I can tell you what these graphs are going to look like. I didn't know what this graph was going to look like. I had no clue. All right. But when I implicitly define them as functions, take a look at what we can show. We can show a graph with the slope of negative 1 and a y-intercept at positive 1. And then we can also show a graph of a line with a slope of negative 1 and a y-intercept at negative 1. And now I can make a conclusion that ultimately it's just a set of parallel lines, all right? And that this relationship shows that there's no x and y's in common. There will be no quote-unquote solution to this equation. 
So go ahead and fill on out the tiny URL that you see here as kind of a, a checkpoint for you guys. And uh, this will be also a part of your attendance for watching the video for, um, uh, for this class. Have a good one, guys.